afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager at Barometer Capital, and welcome again to another Tuesday afternoon webcast. Joining me today, as always, is David Burroughs, our Chief Investment Strategist and President at Barometer. And during the course of this uh, webcast, we will be pleased to provide you a macro overview and as well address those questions that you might have. So don't be shy. Email me, phastings at barometercapital.ca or send a message via the chat. And with that, I turn this afternoon's conversation over to the one and only David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Hi, Pam. How are you? I'm well. Thank you, Dave. How are you? Just great, thanks. The uh, The snow wasn't so welcome last night here in Toronto, but <laughs> spring is coming. I feel like that was the last snow for the season. So hopefully that's the, the case and you can get up to the cottage sooner rather than later. Let's, let's hope. Let's hope. Uh, I want to welcome everybody for joining us today. Uh, it continues to be sort of a tricky market. Uh, so we're working our way through this uh, last few months the best way we can. And that's just by following process. If I was making decisions based on what I read in the newspaper, <clears throat> I'd be probably sitting with a mitt full of cash, which I think a lot of people are. Uh, but there are some pretty clear themes in this market. There certainly are some places to avoid. Uh, and we just have to take uh, sort of one step at a time and reassess uh, markets sort of day by day. So just quickly, just off the top, as we always do, we'll start just with some sort of big structural themes. Our, our base belief, of course, is we don't have to be everywhere. We have to pick our spots. Uh, and we want a structural theme behind us or a tailwind that, that increases our odds of success. So our clients can be anywhere. They could be in equities, they could be in fixed income, they could be in commodities, they could be in real estate, uh, often, lots of choices. Um, but our job is to target the portfolios and to be dynamic as opposed to being just plain strategic, having a little of everything. Um, from, a, from an equity perspective, our base belief is that we're in a bull market. And we have been a structural bull market since uh, 2013 when we exceeded the 2000 highs. And since then, it's been sort of three steps forward, one step back. There certainly are corrections along the way. Uh, 2015 was tricky, 2015, 16, sorry. Certainly there was a good size pullback in 2018 at the end of the year. There was a very sharp pullback <clears throat> late, <coughs> excuse me, early in 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. But that's really no different than what happened in the 80s and 90s, no different than what happened in the structural bull market of the 50s and 60s. <clears throat> these things happen and you have to uh, manage accordingly. So uh, from an equity perspective, this little consolidation we've been going through in the S&P over the last few months, <coughs> excuse me, uh, has, uh, has been fairly typical. Uh, we see these things along the way. If we put it in perspective and we will in a little bit, <clears throat> you know, you get corrections that are either in time this market goes nowhere for a period of time or in price where markets pull back and those corrections can be sharper. But the nature of the market is sort of bull market activity, much like it was through the 80s and 90s. When we look at fixed income, it's been our view that rates were going through a bottoming process over the last two years, sort of a generational bottoming. <clears throat> Often things end with a bang, uh, both on the upside and the downside. And then they reverse and bottoming and rates take some time generally. But when they do bottom, it can be for a long period of time. And when we look at what's happened to the 10 year yield since March of 2020, we've moved from about 40 basis points to this week, 2.9%. And frankly, the move this year has been quite extraordinary after consolidating after the first lift in yields. We broke out at the end of 2021, uh, and we've moved from 1.8 to 2.9%. So that is the market discounting the likelihood of higher interest rates over time. And when we're looking at a 10-year treasury, we're not looking at the next year or the year after. The market is discounting the fact that likely over the next number of years, rates are going to be higher. If we translate that into the long-term theme, and we've talked about this for some time. This was the peak in rates in the early 80s in US Treasury bonds. 
we fell to a generational low at just above you know, 30, 33, 34 basis points in 2020. And for the very first time since the early 1980s, we have broken above the long-term downtrending moving averages, above this long-term trend line that has been in place. So at this point, what was probably conjecture over the last 18 months is turning into reality. We are and have reversed long-term trend. Now that doesn't mean that yields are going straight higher. In fact, when you've got a downward sloping moving average, very often you'll exceed the long-term moving average and then pull back and bounce around for a bit. But from where that happens, we don't know. All we know is we probably have met or we've gotten close to our first objective in higher yields, which means perhaps that we're getting toward near-term lows in bond prices. So to look at the aggregate bond index, this is the AGG ETF, which we commonly put up from the high in price in August of 2020 to the low currently where we're making a new low again this week, the aggregate bond index, which is all issuers and maturities or a sample is down about 14%. Pretty significant move for the average bond portfolio. If we were to look at the TLT, which is the long end of the US bond market, the 20 to 30 year bonds from a peak in the end of March, 2020 to current down almost 34%. So if you had a 34% decline in the stock market, there'd be a lot of upset people. And frankly, if you're a bond investor, you're probably fairly risk averse, probably pretty unhappy about that as well. Certainly at some point you get your money back as your bonds mature, but it could be a long wait without making any money. If we look just only from the beginning of this year, the TLT is down just about 21%. So that plays havoc on asset allocation and portfolios, especially for those who always have to have or feel they have to have a bond component. Um, we've been very careful about being almost void of bonds. In fact, been short bond market over the last <clears throat> several months in our macro portfolio. And while we don't see any sign yet of a turn, we, I'm like guessing we are likely close to seeing some kind of a short-term bottoming in the bond market. Maybe you get a bounce. Uh, we'll watch for that. But at this point, we don't try and pick bottoms. Uh, we just stand aside. So fixed income looks like it continues to be in a bear market. Uh, and if you look at the total amount of negative yielding debt in the middle of 2020, we had almost $18 trillion worth of negative yielding debt. Today, that's down to $2 trillion in the global markets, uh, still some, uh, but it's come, come back a long way. Okay, commodities. Um, our view has been we've been going through a, a reversal or a generational reversal in commodity prices. Um, after many, many years of poor price performance, from the price of anything from copper to wheat and corn, soybeans, um, investment in capacity in new commodity supply has been severely curtailed. And as we've had a pickup in demand, certainly it takes time to bring new capacity on, but there's been a very sharp move in the Rogers Commodities Index, which is an equally weighted basket. These are monthly bars. So we've been marching smartly higher month after month after month. Uh, and, you know, it'll take a long time to reverse that long bear market that went on for over 10 years. Uh, and certainly the companies that produce commodities are the beneficiary of pricing power. So this is a closer look at that same index. A week ago, we talked about the fact it looked like we were coming out of this consolidation after going sideways for a few weeks. And yes, this week we went higher, a little lower today, <clears throat> but things aren't going to go straight higher. Uh, and when we look at what's happened in various areas of commodity markets, it's really interesting. So in white is the percent of the S&P that energy makes up. And if we go back to the worst point, March of 2020, energy made up only 2% of the S&P 500's weightings. Now we know that energy's had a sharp rally and it now makes up over 4% of the S&P. Interesting, at the same time, technology has come down from about 30% of the S&P 
to about 27%. So they are, they are converging, but they're a long way from converging. And this can go on for a long time. This is the S&P uh, Goldman Sachs Commodity Index. And it's, uh, it's the relative performance of commodities versus the S&P. We've only just started to see out performance. We think this can go on for a long time. This is the Rogers uh, Agriculture uh, uh, Index. It also had a very good week this week, continuing strong. Price of cor corn and soybeans and so on uh, have continued to firm up, uh, even though it looks as though there may be more uh, of the corn crop planted in Ukraine than maybe people were concerned about originally, but certainly prices continue to be strong. Uh, natural gas uh, and oil continue to be sh very sh sharply higher. Last week we talked about, we took out these highs, we moved sharply higher over the course week, a little weaker today, um, but certainly oil and gas had a very, very good week. This is the base metals ETF. Uh, again, it's been consolidating, it moved a little higher over the course of the week. Um, and this is the um, uh, S&P, sorry, the, the gold ETF, GLD, which we talked a couple of weeks ago, came out of this wedge and also continues to be strong. So we had a little bit of an opposite day today. Commodities pulled back a little bit, doesn't change anything. Uh, and we did see a bit of a bounce in some of the very oversold assets. That's a good thing. Uh, but in general, these themes continue to play out. There's the RJI, Rogers Commodities ETF. So uh, a week ago, goals were coming out of this. Uh, this is the, um, this is corn just coming out of the same range. So we can see virtually all of the commodities after consolidating for a few weeks took another leg higher over the course of the week. This is, this is last week, that's this week. Uh, okay, let's talk about the S&P 500 and the broader indices. Uh, this was the high in the S&P and that was just around year end. And through the course of the first few months of this year, it's been kind of sloppy. And corrections are painful. They take time to work out. We think that the S&P correction actually was the later part of the correction. The weakness originally started in the NASDAQ. And within the NASDAQ, unprofitable tech peaked out in February of 2021, so over a year ago. We made a low in uh, February. We made have made two higher lows since then. And recently, again, over the last couple of weeks, pulled back and looks like we're trying to put in another higher low, we'll see. But as of this afternoon, we were just starting to come out of this little channel that had been backing and filling. We're still below the long-term moving averages. And we know that within the S&P, there are some strong groups and some weak groups, but this is all corrective, um, corrective behavior. A bunch of the indicators, higher today than where they were in February and March and February. That's a positive. Uh, we'll have to see. But if we take a very long-term view of the value line arithmetic index, this is an index that gives every company in the U.S. a single vote and then tracks an index of equally weighted companies across U.S. equities. The only thing I wanted to show was that when we look at corrections in secular bull markets, so we had a secular bull market that started around 2012. Um, we had a secular bull market through the 1990s. Corrections come two ways. They come in time or they come in price. If you look at the bull market, the, the correction, bull market corrections in the 90s, here was uh, in the 1991-92, nine months of sideways chop. Market only pulled back about one and a half percent. It was a 10 month consolidation in 1994. That was a particularly difficult year. Lots of rotations, things that worked, things that didn't. And people got frustrated after 10 months and eventually we resolved higher. You also have price corrections that happen quickly, a four month correction of 17% in 1998. If we fast forward into this current bull market, 22% over four months, that's a correction in price. 15% over eight months, that's a correction in price. 18% over four months, that's a correction in price. 31% in three months, that's certainly a correction in price. But it's very possible that what we're seeing here is a correction in time. 
It's about 10 months since the value line arithmetic index made its high. It's not made a high since. And it's not impossible that it could weaken from here. But to me, it looks more right now like it's been a correction in, in time. And that can be frustrating. Now, there's been lots of things to worry about. We've got a war going on in, in, uh, in Ukraine. We've got concerns about economic stability in China. We've got uh, concern about rising interest rates. But when I look within the market, I think it's quite interesting. Usually the last thing that corrects are the large cap safest stocks. This is a chart from the middle of last summer of the large cap companies within the S&P versus the S&P. So there's an ETF MGC, which is mega cap companies. And you can see really since about September, the mega caps have been underperforming the S&P itself. It means that the most heavily weighted companies in the index are having an outsized impact on what's happening inside the market. And that causes people concern. This is the AAII bull bear survey. It surveys investors to say, are you feeling bullish? Are you feeling bearish? If we take the number of bulls and subtract the number of bears, we get this outcome. You can see that as of last Friday was the lowest number of bulls in the market going back to 1992. More bearish people than in 2015, 16, which we looked at. More bearish investors, even at the worst point in 2009. More bearish investors than in 2005, which is a good correction year. So over the last 10 months, people have had a chance to do whatever they wanted to do with their portfolios. If their concern was rising rates, go ahead, raise some cash. If your concern was conflict, go ahead and raise some cash. If your concern about what's going on in China and, 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 and coronavirus, raise some cash. But we're at a point where there are very few bulls left and a lot of money has been pulled to the sidelines, yet the market's been basically going sideways. If we look at credit spreads, they're in the most sort of average range they've been in over the last several years. This goes back to 2014. Nowhere near sort of the concerns that we had during coronavirus. When we look at volatility, volatility spiked in March of 2020. When the market was correcting heavily in the early part of this year, volatility spiked to 38. The next time we made a low, it spiked to the list below 38. Next time we made a low, a lower low, actually a little bit lower high. And with the market trading back towards lows, volatility is right down in the mid range. So I think some of the veracity of selling and repositioning is starting to run out of gas. When we look at the equally weighted S&P 500, to give every company a single vote, it looks very different than the S&P. The relative price strength has been rising versus the S&P main index, the market cap weighted. Today, we broke today above the last two weeks of trading. And I think that's relevant. So <clears throat> the average stock is doing better than the largest caps, but sadly, most people are overweight the largest cap stocks because these are the ones that have worked well over time. Over the last number of months, we've come to talk about value. Well, this is the RPV ETF. It's the, the uh, weighted index of value companies within the S&P 500. And look, today we made a new high. So this is a market of haves and have nots. We're gonna talk more about that today. But the value index is making a new relative high versus the S&P itself. It means that there's a very clear trend in place in value stocks. And we're going to see the pretty clear trends in the basic materials and energy companies that sadly make up a small piece of the index for those people who buy passive indices. So let's look at this week's data. Clearly, what's coming is earnings. We're just about to, to embark on the, the most busy period of the earnings season. The week of April uh, 18th, the week we're in, we'll have almost 70 companies in the S&P report. Next week, we have 177. The following week, we have 155. So this is going to be an important couple of weeks. We've been in a period where companies aren't talking about their outlooks. So the market has to figure it out for itself. It's generally a period of a little bit of confusing. And over the next two to three weeks, we're going to get a lot of commentary from companies about the experience that they're having, not only over the last three months, but what their outlook is going forward. 
one of the things we're going to spend a lot of time on is trying to understand how much rising input costs could Im in, 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 uh, impact their earnings. But I think it's always interesting to see what other people think. These are the path of consensus earnings per share for the S&P. And since the beginning of the year, the expectation for earnings this year, despite all the talk of recession and higher rates, the analysts are looking at the company level are raising their estimates for earnings. The expectation currently is for 8.8% earnings growth in 2022. More importantly, this is the typical path of earnings expectations in the first quarter of the year as seen over the last 10 years. And then once you get into earnings, often you start to see estimates rise. Well, there had been far less revision lower over the course of the first quarter in 2022, despite all the things we worry about. And we've already started to see a nice sharp ramp in expectations going forward. So people are concerned about first quarter. Consensus is for one and a half percent growth for 2000, sorry, second quarter 22, 3% growth in third quarter 22, and four and a half percent growth in the late part of the year. While there's concern that there could be slowdown, estimates are in fact going higher. Let's talk about the yield curve one more time. Last week, we talked about the fact that people were concerned that the two-year yield was for a moment higher than the 10-year yield. Let's look at what happened over the course of the week. Two-year yields are 2.57% as of 3.30 this afternoon. The 10-year yield, as of the same time, was 2.91. So you can see we've had a significant widening of the, of, the, uh, of the curve, steepening of the curve. We said last week, the real thing that people, the Fed cares about is three months versus two years. And again, you can see that's very steep. So while I know there are uh, investment dealers who believe that there's a 30 or 40% chance of recession, and we've had lots of talk about it and chance for people to reposition their portfolios accordingly, the bond market is not signaling recession. Okay, at the end of the day, we have to make decisions based on process. What we care about is whether breadth is improving or weakening for the whole market, but specifically for certain parts of the market. And we know that when over time, fewer and fewer stocks are performing well, generally sentiment gets very negative. At some point, breadth starts to expand in certain sectors or themes or the whole market itself. And we care about identifying those parts of the market that are showing expansion and breadth. That's where money is going. And what I mean is, if there's 100 companies in that part of the market, and over time, a higher and higher percentage of companies are in clearly defined upward price trends, it means the rally is broadening. More and more companies are participating. That's healthy. There's no bear markets while we're seeing a broadening market ever. And we see very clear leadership in certain groups within the market. And we watch the market itself to help us decide whether we should be adding new weight or whether we should be taking money out of the market. And we watch for sectors that are showing deterioration. As we sit right now, our Canadian breadth model is solidly positive with about 50% of the stocks in the market in uptrends and that number has been expanding. Globally, about 47% of stocks are in uptrends, and that's been expanding. The U.S., which had been leading from a breadth perspective over the last couple of weeks, has pulled back in very specific areas of the market. But as we said, it's a bifurcated market. And interesting enough, about 50% of the companies in the market are in uptrends, and about 50% are in downtrends. The percent of stocks above the 50-day moving average moved down a little this week. Percent of stocks with positive weekly momentum moved down a little week this week. Percent of stocks making new highs moved down a little this week. And percent of stocks with positive weekly price momentum moved down a little bit this week. So there is some sloppiness out there and we have to be very careful making sure we understand where the selling is taking place and where the strength is. So let's talk about the strength. First and foremost, our Canadian stock market is about the best performing market in the world right now, outside of say Saudi Arabia and Dubai. This is the TSX S&P 60. We're very close to new highs. Relative strength versus the S&P is improving steadily. 
very solid consolidation over the last month, straight sideways. Uh, it's been a very strong performing market. About 60% of our assets are in Canadian equities right now, which is way above what we would tend to have. But it happens to be that some of the sector themes that are working really well are well represented in the Canadian market. Let's talk about these leadership themes. Energy just continues to work. And I know that it was a very frustrating place to be for some people from 2014 through 2021. It's a sector that we avoided for almost six years, but we're moving smartly higher. There are major structural issues that could per pervade for some time, given the fact that there has been so little new investment in capacity in Canada and the US and frankly around the world. Investment boards were put under extreme pressure to be socially conscious, and many of them removed all of their investments from the energy sector, which ultimately meant that the capital costs to develop new uh, properties will fall on the users of oil and gas who ultimately are having to pay higher prices at the pump. So clearly this has been exacerbated by the US, uh, uh, Ukraine, USSR conflict, but this is something that was coming way before the Ukraine conflict. This is the index of Canadian oil and gas producers. We made absolute new high yesterday, relative new high yesterday, led by some of our biggest holdings. I think the third biggest holding in the firm is Tourmaline, which is more focused on gas. I think the fifth largest holding in the firm is CNQ, Canadian Natural Resources. Look, it's just come out of a 14 year period of going sideways. And once you break out of a range like that, it can go on for a long time. But still, many U.S. investors will not buy Canadian oil sands investments because their investors believe that this is not socially conscious. We like it. It's got 100 years of reserve life with very little decline. They made very significant capital investments, none of which have to be repeated in the near term. So this company is going to print cash over the next several years. U.S. oil producers continue to act well also. They made new absolute highs in the XOP yesterday, new relative highs versus market. This is continuing. Sometimes the hardest thing to do in a bull market is to stay in your winning positions because we will get some shakeouts along the way. Oil services also broke out last week, which we talked about on this video uh, and was sharply higher again over the course of the week. Metal, metals and miners were strong, stronger, of course, the, through the course of the week, making new relative highs. Uh, and when we look at the copper miners in particular, this is a really important group. If you believe in uh, clean energy uh, and uh, electric vehicles, we need a lot of copper. We've broken out, consolidated, and now we're making new highs. So the basic materials theme continues to work. Tech B would be one of our top 10 positions in the firm, made a new absolute high yesterday. Uh, the materials ETF on our global macro portfolio, which is made up of all types of basic materials, including chemicals. There's Nutrien, the single largest holding in the firm, you know, has just been a champ over the last number of months. But again, you can't just turn on new capacity overnight. That's the Vanek uh, Agribusiness ETF, MOO. It's made up of all the fer fer uh, fertilizer companies, companies like John Deere and Caterpillar. Uh, this has been a very strong group all across basic materials strong. And steel, again, this week made a new high. Last part of commodities that I'll touch on is the GDX, which is the gold miners index. Much like other areas of commodities, after consolidating, we've come out of this consolidation of the upside. My guess is we can probably pull back a little bit over the next week or so because it was a sharp move higher. But again, these themes that have only just begun can go on for a long time. Let's move away from basic materials. We've talked about that enough over the last few weeks. Uh, uh, defense stocks continue to act well. We made new highs actually today in the ITA, which is the aerospace ETF made up of companies like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, and so on. Uh, they've consolidated going all the way back to the summer of last year. Looks to me like they're ready to go again. And certainly there's gonna be lots of orders coming uh, from governments around the world. Uh, what else do we have? Residential REITs, consolidated over the last two weeks, had a day sharply higher today, making new relative highs versus the market. 
leadership continuing to come from consumer staples. That's the PBJ ETF, including companies like Hershey and Coca-Cola and Kraft and General Mills. These are companies that generally pay a pretty good dividend and also grow them. The dividend growth rate in this ETF has been 14% a year over the last three years. Uh, and then we've had a lot of strength in um, the dividend stocks as a whole. So two key areas that are working. Things that are inflation beneficiaries, companies that are price setters, like the miners and the oil companies and the chemical companies and the agriculture companies. And then you've got the companies with stable dividends that are growing that pose an alternative to fixed income. So I put up a number of different dividend ETFs over the last few weeks. This is the DVY which is an iShares Select Dividend ETF. It's made up of about 50 companies. The dividend yield is 2.9%. The dividend growth rate over the last three years is 16% a year. And if you can get a 3% yield that grows at 16 or 15% a year, we think that looks pretty good for an income investor as opposed to a fixed income, which will not grow. We're gonna get some capital growth. We're gonna get some dividend growth. Get a nice cash flow. So inflation protection on one side, dividend yield on the other, in predictable companies. This is what is working in this market. Let's talk about things that aren't working. And these are big parts of the market. 27% in technology continues to be very sloppy. Had a better day today. We're fishing around trying to find a bottom in here. Maybe we find it. Maybe it continues lower. We're not bottom fishers. We're not going to guess technology continues to be sort of on the out from a leadership perspective. Growth as a whole continues to make new relative lows versus the market. Value making new relative highs, growth making relative lows. Financial services, a major disappointment for a lot of investors over the course of the year. That comes from FinTech, it comes from large banks, it comes from regional banks. Again, we're gonna get earnings and we have started to get earnings from the banks. Some concerns around whether there'll be increased loan losses if the economy slows down, we'll see, but we don't stick around to find out. We got stopped out of a lot of these positions in the early part of the year. Industrials, including areas of robotics and automation continues to be weak and can you see weakening relative price strength. Uh, the transportation stocks and the industrials as a whole are a sector, again, an important sector that just aren't performing and there's the transport sector. So this is really a market of haves and have nots. Uh, the um, consumer discretionary group, very, very difficult. And of course, 70% of the US economy is a consumer. We'll see whether that can find a bottom. And we also have seen weakness in the uh, communication stocks. So lots of things to avoid. We don't have to be everywhere. We gotta find the strong parts of the market. There's the biotech sector a major darling in 2018 and 19. So this is a, this is a tough market. Um, our job isn't to be everywhere. Our job is to pick our spots. Uh, we're gonna continue to use these breadth models to try and target parts of the market that are working, that are seeing net inflows and try to avoid some of these parts of the market that aren't. It's a market where we need to be targeted. It's not about owning an index. It's about understanding what the key structural themes are and focusing our portfolios in those areas. Now, this is a distribution curve of all the major sectors in the US market. In green are those sectors that have the strongest relative price strength versus the rest of the market. The readings along the bottom highlight columns where there are, so for instance, in this column, anything that would be here would be would have between 74 and 78% of all the companies in that sector in uptrends. And of course, it doesn't surprise us, over 75% of companies in the oil industry have their share prices moving higher. In this column, sectors with between 64 and 66% of their companies in uptrends, oil service, electric utilities, and gas utilities. Next highest group, steel and precious metals. All of these sectors have a broad range of companies within their groups performing well. When we go to the other end of the spectrum, sectors that have almost nothing working, 
textiles, that's apparel, leisure, restaurants, semiconductors, home builders, biotech, retail, software, healthcare, gaming, electronics, machinery, autos. If we are in capital letters, it means that breadth is expanding. So we've just seen a new turn in drugs. We'll see whether that turns into something. But when we see a sector turn positive from a breadth perspective, we'll start with a partial position in the strongest company that we can find from a fundamental perspective that is technically sound. And if it starts to work, we'll look to add. So we go through this process daily. It's a very process-driven approach. And this is the way that we evaluate the portfolio. So as it sits right now, our portfolios are very skewed. We continue to have a significant weight across the energy complex. This includes energy producers, both carbon and clean. It includes uh, distribution companies like the pipelines. We have a significant weight, 25% of our portfolios in basic materials, price setters. Consumer staples makes up 9% versus 6.5% in the S&P. That's because these companies have paying us a great dividend. We're seeing dividend growth. We have to have some government bonds in our balanced portfolio, but this is at a bare minimum. Industrials are focused largely in aerospace and defense. It's not in transports. It's not in automation and robotics. It's very specifically defense companies. Financials right now make an extremely small piece of the portfolio, less than 5%. If we go down the curve, technology makes up 2.7%. Consumer discretionary makes up less than 1% versus 12% in the S&P and healthcare about 0.6 of 1%, very targeted portfolios. Now, it's been a tough year for the markets so far. S&P is down about 7.5%. The Canadian Aggregate Bond Index down about 9 and the NASDAQ Composite down about 15 As of last night, all of our barometer private pools and almost all of our separately managed accounts are positive by a pretty good margin. So I think we're in a decent spot, but we gotta keep looking day by day to say what's changing. It's possible that some of the strength in tech today and in consumer could follow through. And if it does, we'll look to start adding some positions. If the short-term breadth models turn green, it may mean that some of this correction is over. We certainly have had time that we've been through. But in the meantime, there are some very clear themes that we can try and capitalize on, and we're going to continue to focus in those areas. Now, yesterday was tax day in the U.S., and we know often in the couple of weeks before tax day, the S&P doesn't do so well because people sell positions to pay their taxes, and there's lots of taxes due this year. We also know that in the weeks following tax day, in 75 to 80 percent of the weeks, we see stronger markets. We'll see whether that follows through this year. But in the meantime, we're just gonna keep assessing. If things get sloppier, we'll get more defensive. If things firm up, we'll look to add new sector exposures. But as it sits right now, portfolios are working pretty well and we'll continue to assess the situation. With that, Pamela, if there's any questions, maybe we can answer them. Thanks so much, David. Yes, we have one question. Christopher wants to know, what are your thoughts on alternative financials such as Brookfield, uh, Onyx, and Fairfax? Hmm. So um, we have a pretty extensive exposure of all of the exposure we have in financials. It's largely in insurance. So we own Fairfax. We own Berkshire Hathaway, which is considered to be a financial, even though it's a conglomerate. Uh, the insurance ETF is performing very, very well. Let's just see if I can throw it up. So the KIE ETF is performing quite well. It's the only exposure that we have in our global macro portfolio. Uh, it's made up of um, reinsurance and ins life insurance companies. That's the one area that looks interesting. Uh, payments companies don't look that interesting. That would be companies like Visa, uh, MasterCard, uh, American Express. Uh, the regional banks look slightly better than the large banks, uh, but frankly, uh, we prefer to focus really right now just on insurance. And, and there are big beneficiaries of higher bond yields. Thanks so much, David. The global macro pool has been 
performing incredibly well. Can you speak to the strength of the performance? What are maybe three three uh, items that uh, you guys are doing, implementing, that is really driving performance there? Well, look, I mean, uh, so Global Macro is a multi-asset portfolio. It's not specifically an equity portfolio. So we actually have very little equity exposure in there right now. Uh, we have we have some equity surrounding commodities, you know, oil producers, uh, metals and mining companies. Uh, we have exposure to uranium, uh, which has been doing quite well. Uh, we have quite a lot of commodity exposure because that asset class clearly has a tailwind and I think that it could go on for a really long time. Um, we've been short uh, the bond market. I mean, here's, here's that TLT. And, and frankly, we've taken off about uh, two thirds of our short position now in fixed income because they've moved a long way uh, and we don't want to see a big bounce, which you know can happen even in a bear market. Um, and um, and uh, so we've been, been pretty targeted on the long side in inflation oriented investments. And we've, we've talked about that sort of over the last now 18 months as being something that we believe strongly in. But I just want to you know, make that clear that this could be still very early stages uh, for, these, for these themes. I mean, you know, when you get sectors moving out of ranges that they were in for years and years to the upside, that's generally just like in stocks. If, if the market goes sideways like it did from 2000 through 2013, once it broke out, like you got years in front of you. We think that that could be the case in commodity markets and nobody owns commodities. Nobody, frankly, even wants to hear about commodities. That's just fine. Uh, but that's been, that's been a major source, uh, source of return. And I think that after 45 years of falling interest rates or 40 years of falling interest rates, that's disinflation. We are now in reflation or inflation and it'll come in fits and starts, but it could go on for you know, 15 or 20 years. Thanks so much, Dave. How has the music fund uh, per been performing? I know that's uh, a great alternative investment vehicle that we yeah. offer to our clients. Perhaps you could well, just comment on that. Yeah, so, so just, just in simple terms, um, it's always been our belief that we have to find asset classes, maybe that have been out of favor, that go through some structural change, and then they get revalued for a long period of time. And so one of our big concerns was that our view was fixed income was becoming much riskier than people thought, and we needed to find other sources of return. Um, our, our, our high income or tactical income portfolio are made up currently of dividend growth stocks, which we think do well in rising rates. Um, but you need to find other things. And uh, music royalties that we think are quite interesting because streaming revenues are growing at about 15% a year. Uh, and if you own solid properties, portfolios of songs that are really well known, and we have some of the best known, most played songs in history, um, they have a natural growth rate. And we think that there is inflation protection built in because the streaming companies over time raise their price a little, like, like, um, like Netflix has and like Spotify has. And so these are things that are paying us yields of in the 8% range. And we think they'll grow a little every year. And we think that um, it's highly likely that as people come to understand streaming, they will value them like other income assets, which are trading at much lower yields, which means prices would go up a fair bit. So we're looking for alternatives like this. We use the, the music fund as one of the investments for our income investors. Uh, we're looking at a new one right now, which is um, uh, related to subscription software. Um, but these are things we think that can supplement in a rising rate environment. And that these are the types of things that we put in the tactical income portfolio, which has been you know, just a champ since, since 2001 when it started. Thanks so much, David. Last question, it's on seasonality. Does Barometer believe in looking at seasonality when constructing portfolios? Sure. I mean, or, can, um, yeah. or would we lighten up on commodities and energy in May? Yeah, we, we absolutely look at it. Um, 
I did a 10% reduction in some of our commodity positions yesterday in macro, not because I don't think they're they're performing well, or that there's anything looks like it's changing, but just, you know, they can pull back at any time. Um, I talked this morning on morning meeting about the fact that May through October, if you go back over the last 20 years, has had in general a significantly lower return than the October through May period. I think that if you took the last 56 years, 23 of them uh, were negative in the summer uh, from, from May through October. And there were about 10 periods of those 23 where there were 10% corrections. Now you can make a case that we've seen a 10 month correction already, 12 months if you take, take, take some of the areas of tech. So I think you have to think about it and be aware of it, but we're gonna use the models that we have to make the ultimate decisions. Uh, but you know, I always breathe a sigh of relief when we hit November. <laughs> So we'll see what it what brings this year. There are years when the summer is very, very good, and I, I'm not going to make a decision just purely based on a calendar. But at the end of the day, I think our number one job, actually, Pam, is just to understand the range of possibilities. Like, what are the things that can happen? I think a lot of people are used to right now thinking about what happens in falling rates, and they aren't used to thinking about what happens in rising rates. There's been some wonderful bull markets during rising rates. You just have to be in the right spots. And so, yeah, summer seasonality is something that we certainly keep in mind and, and we keep an eye on. Thanks so much, David. Well, that brings us to the tail end of this webcast. David, as always, we thank you for your thorough review and we look forward to seeing everyone next week. Same time, same place. Dave, I'll leave you with the final word. Look, summer's coming. Hopefully everyone's gonna get outside and enjoy themselves get past some of this COVID stuff. If you've got questions, things you're worried about, things you'd like to talk about, things you don't understand, give us a call. We're here. Uh, it's, it's nice to be here in the office of downtown Toronto. I haven't been here all that much over the last two years and uh, plan to be here pretty solidly going forward. But um, we're, we're here to talk, so don't hesitate to give us a call. And if you've got topics we'd like, you'd like us to cover, send them in to us. And uh, in between, if you care, I try and post a few things on Twitter every couple of days uh, as to what we're thinking. And, and that's at barometer.ca, at barometer CA. Um, uh, give us a follow. And uh, thanks for tuning in today. We'll see you again next week. Thanks, Dave.